seen you stop the lightning and thunder when you said the word i heard peace be still when the mountain won't move still i will choose to say
Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What are you talking about? What's the fire you're talking about? The cloven tongues, the power of the Holy Ghost that descended as they were together agreed in one place. They were seeking after God. He said, go, go to Jerusalem and tarry and wait until I send the promise of the, what is the promise? The promise is the Holy Ghost. It's the infilling of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So welcome to Apostolic Faith Tabernacle on Pentecost Sunday. So we're going to ask you this question. You ready? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel the fire? Oh, 
Yeah. 
putting on a show for anybody. When you see us dance on this platform, when you see us get excited, it's an audience of one. There's a lot 
have people in this room, but there's only one that I'm worried about. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Let your praise out this morning. in a pattern of stopping but I want to say this because the Bible says make mention that his name be exalted you can ask my husband up until last night I didn't know if I was going to have a voice to sing this morning but I want to tell you something we walked in here we began to practice and we started lifting up the name of Jesus and I just want you to know I got it all. I've got it all. Again, I'm going to say, I may be crazy and that's okay, but I'm going to tell you something. I love him too much and I love you too much to just come in here and say, well, it's church as usual. We'll go through the motions. We'll sing our songs. Pastor associate pastor preach and we'll all go home no we came for a move of God and every time we come into this place we come for a move of God sometimes it might be on that high level sometimes it might take you to that deep level but you gotta have it all you gotta have it all come on let's sing it again can we we feel a jailbreak Great. 
tremendous presence of the Lord is in this place. Welcome to Apostolic Faith Tabernacle on Pentecost Sunday. That's the reason we're acting a little crazy. We're celebrating something that's been going on for thousands of years, but it's unique to us because it identifies us by experience, by relationship with God. We welcome all you. Glad that you're here with us today. Thank you for your worship. and Thank God for wonderful presence of the Lord that we feel here right now. Hallelujah. Um, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer while his wonderful atmosphere of the presence of God here today. And um, just ask God on behalf of all of these needs that you'll see on the overhead, let's believe God to minister to these folks in a special way. I would like to ask you to pray especially for Brother Douglas Bryan. He is recovering from a uh, retina tear and uh, a macular repair so if you would um, pray that the Lord would help and expedite that very very quickly and uh, get him taken care of and there are a lot of a lot of folks need a special touch across this building I'm sure there's a need that might be on your mind right now would you believe the Lord with us together and just Put it all in before the Lord, casting all your cares upon him. Let's talk to the Lord right now. Would you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, you see all these needs. There's no one like you, Lord. We believe you that you're going to move on behalf of these needs today. We believe you that you're the miracle worker. Hallelujah. We believe you, God, that you are the healer of every disease, every sickness, all infirmity, and by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We step into that realm, cursing every spirit of infirmity, believing you for a divine touch in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Sister Kristen just made mention a while ago of a scripture that's one of my favorites, declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name be exalted. And uh, I think it's just appropriate for me to share with you what happened Wednesday night. Brother, on Thursday morning, I, um, well, let me back up here just a minute. Brother Steve Walker, wave your hand, sir. Brother Steve Walker, you need to pray for him on a number of levels. Number one is he needs to quit falling off the scaffolding. So if you'd pray that Brother Steve would quit falling, praise God. Uh, he fell and hurt himself pretty good, pretty bad. What is it? Pretty good, pretty bad. Um, two or three weeks ago and in February oh okay time flies and you're having fun but anyway he uh, he came in here Wednesday night dragging a leg and big bandage and he was all messed up so he come he came up here and so I walked down there where he was at and I said, what's going on, man? He said, I fell off the scaffold. And I said, again? And uh, he was all messed up. This is what I got as a text from him Thursday morning. Just wanted to give you an update. Tuesday night, could not sleep through the night, even with pain pills. Could not walk yesterday morning. 
shuffled into church last night, ankle, knee, and shoulder in terrible pain yesterday. Last night after service, went to the grocery store, walked the entire store, no ankle pain, slept through the night, no shoulder or knee pain, got up this morning, feel like I could do the two-step. He's doing that for Jesus, obviously. Thank you, Lord, for healing this body. Praise God. And he's over there shaking his leg like wasn't anything wrong a while ago. So praise God. I like to tell you what God is doing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I'm going to let you be seated. I'm going to talk my way into a text here. Um, hopefully this will turn out to be preaching. But the other day, um, I felt like I heard from the Lord. And I want to share some things with you that in my estimation, my feeling, um, this has been something that's been gradually coming on in society for a long time. And I made mention to you the reason we have thermostats in here is because when it's 100 degrees outside, we don't want it 100 degrees in here. So we have thermostats, and thank God, air conditioners, as long as they stay working, everything's wonderful, and we go over and adjust them. And what we're doing is trying to keep the outside atmosphere from coming inside. If it's 15 degrees, we turn the heat on, raise the temperature up in here. Why are we doing that? Because we want a different atmosphere in the church than what's in the world. Because inevitably, I'm, you know, I'm, I put a concrete block around, went around it two or three times so I can say I've been around a block. But um, now I don't have to do that. I'm of an age that qualifies me to make some statements that I'm about to make. And um, I have observed through the years in the church and specifically organizational work. That only thing it takes is a matter of time and what you see going on in the world eventually begins to be affecting the church and begins to bleed through the walls. Doesn't matter how much insulation you put around, it still has a tendency in time. You can make R whatever on the ceiling and on the sides and all that, but you'll never be able to just say we need no influence on the inside, we'll never be affected by the outside. It will make its way in, just given time. If you don't do anything to push it back. And one thing we need to always make sure is there is a sanctified holy spot right around this place right here. And it's a fearful thing to stand in it, but it's a must that we reserve that as that gigantic atmosphere adjuster of the thermostat to be able to preach the word of God without fear or favor because you have to make those adjustments. Because given time, given time, if nothing's said, say, Brother Anderson, this is supposed to be Pentecost Sunday. It is Pentecost Sunday. And uh, I believe it's going to work out just fine. So it's got to be adjusted in order to respond to that. So the other day I felt like the Lord impressed this upon me and some words close to this, and it was the sin of convenience. I'm actually preaching today the curse of convenience. That may not make a whole lot of sense to you at the moment, but I'll simply tell you that our response to difficulty defines our commitment. Now, I'll try to not go this slow the whole time, but some stuff you just can't swallow fast. That's the reason that businesses have this slogan, location, location, location. You know why? 
It's because they want to know that the more convenient they're what they call easy off, easy on, puts them in a particular position to where more foot traffic or traffic is more easily, uh, it's easier for them to access the business. Y'all know what I'm talking about? So everything is geared around trying to make sure of the ease of access. We have convenience stores. I've never bought any convenience there. I've bought a few other items, but but they are their idea is to help you make sure that you are able to get some things without having to go all the way into town or whatever. It's convenient. Everybody say convenient. Many stores and, and whatever might be the place, they will make the announcement that they have convenient parking. But we have lived in a time and we have reached a place to where we have gotten addicted to convenience. But may I tell you today, and may I rise to preach to you today on this Pentecost Sunday, that God does not measure our commitment by how convenient we get things, but we must be committed over convenience. We say everything about how much the value of something is by how willing we are to be inconvenienced on behalf of it. It's all the way back in 1 Kings chapter 12. I'm going to read this now for you just as a starting spot. But as, before we get into that, let me tell you that there was uh, a problem that developed in relationship with Israel and Judah. There were ten tribes that broke off from um, Rehoboam, and Judah stayed with him because of his, um, of, of his plan and uh, basically arrogance. And so there were some problems that developed, and they took ten tribes and went after Jeroboam. When they went to Jeroboam, uh, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom, he saw these people going back to Jerusalem to worship. And his fear became politically motivated that these people would get back into uh, some type of fellowship with Rehoboam because Rehoboam's uh, place was in Jerusalem. And so that's where the temple and that's where the worship was. Jeroboam came up with this idea. And this is what he said. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. What he was doing was saying, it is inconvenient for you to go to the house of God and worship. It's inconvenient, and it's old-timey. You don't go back and do the same way that we used to do. What we need to do is modernize this thing, and we need to bring it to you, and we'll, we'll, we'll fashion it. Ladies and gentlemen, what kind of 
um, a hideous idea would it be to walk up to somebody, point at a golden calf, and say, that's what's brought you out of the wilderness. That's what brought you out of Egyptian bondage when they knew that it was God himself. So I am preaching to you today that we cannot allow ourselves to be caught into the modernization of this world and bring the church into that era and say that we just make everything convenient. I am telling you on this Pentecost Sunday that there is commitment that was originated with this apostolic church and it is commitment that keeps us now it's not how convenient we can make it it's inconvenient to go to prayer meeting it's inconvenient to get up and go to the house of God it's inconvenient to worship like we worship it's inconvenient to live the life of separation that we do but it's all right ladies and gentlemen because convenience itself is a curse that God cannot stand and God is called God is calling for commitment out of people that love him. They have to be committed, not worried about convenience. Yeah. Hallelujah. Matter of fact, I have, I, have break, I have broken this down before, but I'll try to just pass through it real quick. Like, But you remember when Jesus left the... the uh, triumphant entry and they had been worshiping him and and he goes right from there instead of riding that cloud of victory of Hosanna he sits down and he cries over Jerusalem then the next thing you know you find him at the temple and at the temple he's walking around and he's observing some things and he's finding there that you could walk in and you could actually Say, well, I believe I'll take that lamb right over there. And then the, he'd go in there and they'd offer that lamb for him. So he, buy, he would buy the lamb, let them produce their stuff in the temple, and he, he could pretty quickly, he could probably not even miss his lunch hour. But if you, if you traced all this back, you had to find out that God said, I want you to put that lamb up for 14 days. Everybody all right? I want you to inspect this lamb. I want you to get to know this lamb. I want you to have a relationship with this lamb. You're probably going to actually name him. You're probably going to get to call him. Anybody ever know what I'm, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody grown up on the farm to where they, you know, they, they decide they're going to, they're going to put up a, a calf, a butcher, a pig to butcher. You'd start feeding it, and sometimes that was your assignment. You had to go out and feed them, and eventually well, that old calf would kind of start. He'd get to know you, and he'd start rubbing up against you whenever you're trying to get the food. In the Slaughter day came, it did a little something to you. It mattered. You weren't as thrilled about killing it anymore. Steak didn't taste as good when you knew it came from that calf. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So don't you believe that there was probably a truth being woven into God's law that said, I want you to, I want you to put him up for 14 days and I want you to feed him and I want you to inspect him. You know what that meant? That meant running your finger through his wool, talking to him, rubbing around on him, because you're doing the inspection that you there's not supposed to be any blemish. So you knew every inch of that lamb by the time you got to the temple with him. But Jesus walks in there that day, and what he, what he beholds is something foreign to what it began. We figured out how to make this convenient. Now, Brother Will, thank you very much that you, uh, that you helped me out. I, I felt you paved the road a while ago. That, now, you can't quit church just because the preacher offends you because he said so. 
It's law and gospel according to the gospel of will. That's God's will. And if you don't believe me, ask Sister Kristen. She found God's will a long time ago. Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. So, so they said, we'll modernize this thing. We'll keep the sheep out back. You can just kind of drive by and say, I'll take that one right there. You don't know anything about that one. It has no name to you. And when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, you're not going to miss it. Matter of fact, just run your card through this square here. We are having to charge more because of COVID. Supply chain issues. We can't get as many lambs as we used to. You better be thankful we had one back here for you. You're doing good, Brother A. Thank you. That's what Jesus was beholding. And the Bible thought it was so important. God ordained that his word carve out in the Gospels the scene of him sitting there planting together a whip. Because there was something rising up within him that he had seen a nation that had gotten their ideals so much on convenience that they had so contaminated true worship with convenience that it was foreign. Isaiah had prophesied what was going to happen. He's one of these days he said, you'll serve me with your lips, but your heart's far from me. I know it's a little heavy right now, but we're, we're, we're getting somewhere. Thus this scripture jumped out at me several years ago, and it just has never gotten out of my system, so I'm going to read it to you from the Gospel of John about what he did there. He cast out St. John chapter 2, verse uh, 16, he said unto them that sold doves. Of course, he had, he had done his, his work there. He said, take these things hence. Make not my father's house and house of the only place in Scripture that it's used, merchandise. Why is the word merchandise used? Because merchandise goes hand in hand and is parallel with shopping. Because in shopping today, you don't buy the whole store. You just go pick what you like and leave the rest on the rack. Oh, well, it's not going very good, is it? Thus, we as a society have learned to merchandise the church. We want to make it to fit us. We want to make the church what we describe it to be. Ladies and gentlemen, please don't be offended when I tell you the purpose of the church is not to please us. The purpose of the church is to make us please him. He said, you made my house a house of merchandise, but I want you to know that my house should be called a house of prayer. Why? Because you come to him to ask, is there anything I can do for you, Lord? Is there anything that needs to be changed about me? I'm not, I'm not telling you what I'm going to pick and what I'm going to leave. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there is a depth of what's going on right now in this service because I am fighting against hell when I tell you that you don't just step up in the world right now and say, well, you know, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a religion of convenience. It's No, ladies and gentlemen, it is an experience of sacrifice. It is something that we rise up. Jeroboam cannot build false, uh, false gods and appease everybody because it will never 
satisfy your heart's desire for the touch of the real true God. And there will never be an artificial substitute that this world can provide to you that can give you artificial church that will satisfy the hunger. Listen, drug addiction is real. Listen, all types of uh, social situations that are going on in our world. Depression is real. Oppression is real. Divorce is real. Heartache is real. Sickness is real. Heart attack is real. Backaches are real. All of these things are real. We need a real God. We need a real church. We need the real truth to come blazing through in this city, in this world of degradation. Preach me the truth. Give it to me like it is. I'm not worried about convenience. I'm worried about the real deal. I believe the Lord spoke to me something out of and if you hear me say that a number of times, it's because I think he's been talking to me quite a bit lately. Mm. But he, do you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, I don't know that I'll read all of it. I just want to get this here. These first first verse and maybe the first line of the second verse. I'll try to hurry along here. Verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 15. And that he was seen of Cephas, talking about the resurrection and the proof of the resurrection, okay? So he was seen of Peter, then of the twelve. Now watch this, verse 6. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. So one time they had a crowd of over 500. But today, we sang and we were reminded, Sister Kristen, and exhorted, great job, reminding us that in that upper room, everybody say 120. Well, that's not even a good percentage of the 500. which means there were a lot of folks that connected with him in his resurrection that were not at the upper room. May I be so bold as just throw it out here and tell you that it might have not been convenient? Might not fit their schedule? It might have altered their plans. But the greatest thing that was about to happen in this universe was pending for the upper room. Now look, there were multiplied thousands out in the street because it was feast. Everybody say feast. It was celebration. Pentecost, so, oh God have mercy, this is good. They were celebrating the occasion and missing the experience. They were so wrapped up with what their dogma said that Pentecost was supposed to be about that they were missing the genuine move of the Spirit of God and the infilling of the Holy Ghost that was about to take place. I am asking you today if you will somehow lend me your ear, your heart, and your thoughts that I invite you, let's go beyond normal. Let's go beyond what this world's denominationalism is trying to do. And saying, we've done our obligation. We, we've, we've, we were at church today. I know, but were you really at church? Oh, my goodness. It's almost noon. I would sure not want to inconvenience anybody preaching a message like this. thought I'd throw Woo. come 
on now. Shut up. But I'd lay it all down right now. If while we're in the midst of a real true move of God, some of these hungry souls in here that's found apostolic faith tabernacle could throw their hands in the air and experience Pentecost move upon them even while I'm preaching the Word of God. Let's go ahead and start speaking in tongues and let the Spirit of God give them that utterance. Because we're not here because it's convenient. We're here because we're hungry. We're here because we dropped everything else. We put everything else on the back burner. We showed up today because we're serious about this. This is urgent in our spirit, and we've got to make it happen. But this is what the Holy Ghost spoke to me. I feel the Holy Ghost from the top of my head to the sole of my feet right now. I'm going to tell you something. He said, but the ones that I filled were the ones that came out from among them. They had the religion. They were their denominationalism. They were their religious world. But I called some people to the upper room, and they were willing to separate. They were missing the festivities, ladies and gentlemen. God have mercy. Somebody ought to help me right now. Somebody ought to help me right now. They shot up. No, they didn't time it down to 15 minutes. We better get up there. No, no, no. They've been there seven days, and they have no idea, sir. They have no idea. Because the only thing they're there with was a time clock that said, until. That's all their clock said. Go tarry in the city of Jerusalem. He didn't say it's going to happen on high noon. He didn't say it's going to happen at 3 o'clock. He said, I just, I just need some people that I don't have to serve with convenience, that want me bad enough that they will put their entire life on hold to be filled with my spirit. That's all I'm asking for. And I just got 120 out of all those thousands that I've ministered to. So there's... We've got to... As it was then, so it is now. I am calling once again for those that will be committed. I am inviting you away from the festivities. I am inviting you away from the regular schedule. And I am asking you, do you love me enough to be committed? I cannot make it convenient for you, for it does not bear witness with character of what it takes to be my child. So my gospel shall not be convenient. But if you will walk with me and commit your whole life to me, you will see the results, for I will show up with the genuine manifestation of my spirit, saith the Lord. Let's throw our hands in the air right now. Hallelujah. Let's stand, shall we? Uh. Mark chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. Oh, God. Judas is Cariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. 
Ladies and gentlemen, your search for convenience is never going to be far from betrayal. If it's got to be that certain personality in the pulpit or you're not going to like it, it's got to be a certain person singing. It's got to be a certain song. It's got to be a certain time. Your demand for convenience is never going to be far from betraying him. Acts 24, after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith of Christ, and he reasoned, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment. To come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. I want to drop down to verse 27, please, brother. But after two years, Porteus Festus came into Felix's room and Felix willing to show the Jews a pleasure left Paul down. I don't find where Felix ever found God because it was lost in his search for convenience. I'll have to come back and preach some of this other stuff to you. But I want to I want to close with this. Jesus sat down to eat. And while he was sitting there eating, there was this woman that walked in. She had learned what it was like to not wait on convenience. And she didn't take the lid off. She didn't access it in some preservable way. Sister Tidwell, she broke the alabaster box. I'm going to empty it. I'm going to pour my praise probably all of her life's investment. But something she sensed in her heart the day was coming. Can I somehow say this? The day is coming close. If you're going to get in this thing, I advise you to break the alabaster box. Don't just take the lid off of the little bottle somewhere. But it's time now to give it all you've got. Please, I'm begging you. I'm not trying to be mean. There's something in breaking in my own spirit right now. Don't tell me, preacher, you got to make it a little bit more convenient for me. You got to make it where it's not so demanding. I don't have the authority, the ability to do that. What I've got to do is tell you that convenience has got a curse that goes with it. She broke. She broke that alabaster box. And I don't know, it's kind of weird in human thinking. And I, I could read through this and miss this so bad till God poked me in the head yesterday. Because the Bible says it like this. In the Synoptic Gospels telling this story. It says that Jesus 
had gone to Simon the leper's house. And he was providing him a meal, but that's getting ridiculous. Your Bible says it was Simon the leper's house. Now look, very basic, even less than 101. <laughs> you know you don't go to a leper's house to eat. Why does he call Simon the leper? Let's just hang that in the air a minute. Let me read to you what Jesus said. Jesus said, Simon, I have somewhat to say it to thee. He said, Master, say on. Isn't it amazing how we feel like we're in good shape? Sure. Be careful if you tell him sure. He said, there was a certain creditor had two debtors, and one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. He had nothing to pay, and he frankly forgave them both. Tell me which of them loved him the most. Simon said, I suppose the guy that he forgave the most. He said, thou hast rightly judged. He goes on through there, and he explains. Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And these, this is what I heard. She loved me because she knew the magnitude of what I had done for her. But the only reason Jesus could be at Simon the leper's house is that Simon the leper used to be a leper. And he's trying to say, Simon, I guess all I did for you was heal you of lepers. <laughs> Sorry, that's all I did. It doesn't seem like I did much for you. Because you want things convenient. It gets out a little bit out of your norm. You get critical. You see people that get down on their knees and crawl to an altar. That's not necessary. Huh. I'm sorry. I guess all I did for you was took your lepers hallelujah the room grew still as she made her way to Jesus she stumbled through the tears that made her <laughs> cry <laughs> Such pain. Some spoke in anger. Oh, yeah. Heard folks whisper, There's no place here for her kind. Ladies and gentlemen, Pentecost was not convenient. Still, on she came through the shame that flushed her face. Oh. Until at last she knelt oh. before. Oh, and though, and though she spoke, she spoke no, no words, words. everything she 
she said was heard as she poured her love for the master from her box of alabaster. I've come to pour my praise on him like oil. Alabaster, oh, please don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hands. You weren't there.
Please don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I try. thankful for the word we heard today. God help us. God help us. Just a couple of announcements real quick. First of all, we have a meeting for all of those that are going to kids camp and their parents. If you have kids going, you need to uh, meet with us in the West Side foyer right after service today as kids camp will be getting started this week and then next week will be youth camp and the next week will be senior camp so lots going on also want to remind you that tomorrow will be the first Monday of the month so that will be our uh, prayer meetings is going to be on Monday at seven o'clock this week there will be no prayer meeting Tuesday so the ladies will pray here in the sanctuary the men will pray uh, in the fellowship hall tomorrow night starting at 7 p.m. Amen. Also, we got church Wednesday night. Looking forward to that. 7 p.m. Come back to the house of the Lord expecting a great move of God. Amen. Y'all can be dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great, great Pentecost Sunday.